Today, we're going to wrap up one of the major themes in the Gospel of Luke, which is God's love for the lost. And then next week, we'll turn our attention to the vindication of Jesus, which is the last major theme of Luke. And we'll be doing that for three weeks. But today, what we'll see is that Jesus not only loves the lost, but he also sets them up as a standard for what it looks like to be a follower of him. Now, at Liberty, we talk about hard topics. If you were a part of our series last year where we did the called out ones, we talked about a number of hard topics back to back. It was exhausting, but we did it. Congratulations. But we, we talk about hard topics here. And giving is what we're going to talk about today, which I know is not like you're like, let's go to church and hear about how we can give our money, right? Everybody high fives each other and they're like, yeah, let's do it. I know giving is not everyone's favorite topic. It's not a topic I particularly love to talk about, but giving your money is an act of worship to God particularly giving to your local church. And this is what Jesus calls us to. No other person in the Bible talks about money more than Jesus does. No other person. And no other gospel talks about money more than Luke's gospel. So Jesus and Luke, what they want you to know is that money has a cert- can have a certain stranglehold on you like nothing else can. So that's why they talk about it so much. Now, depending on your background, you've probably heard Christians talk about money one or two ways. One, they talk about it all the time. Right? It's like, well, if you, put the, if you take the money and you, and you put it at the feet of the man of God, then all the blessings will start coming down to you. Right? Maybe that's your experience. Or they're always talking about money. But some of us have gone and have Christian church backgrounds where we've reacted to that, and so we never talk about that. We never talk about money. We act like it's not a really big deal. And neither of those are correct. Because while Jesus doesn't talk about money all the time, he does talk about it, so we need to talk about it. If we're going to be faithful to him, is what we have to talk about. So we're going to talk about giving is an act of worship measured by what it costs. Giving is an act of worship. And the way God measures your giving is not how much you give necessarily, but how much it costs you when you give it. So giving is as an act of worship. I want to talk about that. Then I want to talk about how giving has a standard and then giving has a cost. So let's look at verse 1, talk about giving as worship. Jesus looked up, and so Jesus is in the temple right now, and he looked up, and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. Now, stop there. Jesus is in the temple, and he watches two types of people, the rich and a widow, give money. And what we see here is that giving is an act of worship. They're in the temple, they're giving money, it's an act of worship. But giving is an act of worship that where we show gratitude to God for what he's done for us. After God freed the Israelites from Egypt, right, so rewind the game tape of the Bible and you go back to when God freed Israel from Egypt, God promised to care for them. But then God warns them in Deuteronomy chapter 8, he says, Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. Did you catch that? God says, hold up. There's going to be a moment where you're going to be tempted to say, my wealth is my wealth, and I earned it. And God says, hold up. Beware you do that. Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. See, God's saying, I saved you from the clutches of Pharaoh. I saved you from the clutches of sin, death, and the devil, and all your wealth was not earned by you. It was given to you. All of it. By God. So all of your wealth, everything that attributes to your, or contributes to your wealth, is on loan from God. So when it came down to how the Israelites could use their God-given wealth, God had a right to say how it can be used because it's really his money. So kids, teenagers, I don't know if you know this, but uh, adults know this, but if you take out a mortgage from the bank, 
you're required to use it to purchase a home. If you take out a loan for a car, you're required by the bank to use it for what? A car. Just because the money's in your bank account doesn't mean it's yours to determine what you want to do with it. And the same thing is true for the money God gives us. Just because it's in our bank account doesn't mean it's ours to determine how we want to use it. God gave it to us, so God made giving an act of worship. So the Israelites were required to tithe. Now, tithe is giving a tenth of the parts of their God-given wealth back to him. So they would do that through giving to the temple and giving to the priest. And the priest actually would give, the Levites would give to like the high priest as well. So everyone was kind of giving of their tithes. Now scholars debate this, but they gave somewhere between 12 to 14 tithes over seven years. 12 to 14. And normally when we have talked about this at church, we normally say that it's about 10%, but actually scholars are now realizing it's probably closer to 20% of their income is going first to God, and then they're paying everything else with the 80% that's left over. But many of us do the opposite. Rather than give first to God, what do we do? We spend on everything else and see if we have leftovers for God. And I ask you, is that what worship looks like? I'll give my leftovers to God? See, when we worship God with our giving, we're showing we're grateful for God. Does giving God our leftovers show that we're grateful? Like if I love my wife, or if I love my kids, I set them at higher priority than say, hey, when I'm done doing everything that I want to do, then I'll spend time with you. Then I'll give an effort. See, we, giving is an act of worship to show we're grateful for what God has done for us, that he's rescued us, and he cares for our needs. Because it's not whether or not we worship. It's what we worship. You and I worship something or someone, and the way I use my money reveals if I worship God or if I worship something else. Plain and simple. So much to the point what God does in Malachi 3.8, he says this, will man rob God? And they might say, okay, well, how are we robbing you, God? How are we doing that? God says, you are robbing me in your tithes and contributions. Have you ever thought about that? Have I ever thought about that when I hold my money back from God? That not only am I disobeying him, I'm actually robbing him. Why? Because it's not my money. And so giving also has a standard. So giving is an act of worship, but it has a standard. There's a standard that's set. So if you look at verse 3, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, right? So the rich gave their wealth. The widow gave two coins. Jesus says, Truly I tell you, this widow has put in more than all of them. Why? For they have contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. There's a standard to giving. In Jesus' day, the Jews would come to the temple, they would give their tithes, and what, what probably is happening here is they're giving their tithes, and then somebody would announce it. Right? It'd be like you gave your offering in the offering basket, and then we bring up Jim up here, one of our great liturgists. Jim would come up here, and he'd be like, Evan gave $100. So Jesus hears what the people give. And here's that the widow gives two coins. And the, both of them give what's required of them. The rich give what's required of them, but the woman gives what's required of her. See, in the first century world, being a widow was as close to a death sentence as possible. There was no easy way for you to earn income without a husband. The only easy way was, um, because there's kids here, let's just say you would have to work the night. That's the only way you'd make money. And God knew this. So God compassionately gave widows a different standard for giving. So she gives two lepta coins. 
two lepta, which is the equivalent of five minutes of work at minimum wage. That's all she gives. Pennies. See, as a kid in Sunday school, I was often told this story like it was like the scene of a rap video, right? Where like the rich are just like making it rain, right? And they're pouring all these buckets of money into the offering and it's dumping out all over the place and everyone's like high-fiving them and they're like, yeah, look how much money I have. I just like throw it up in the air. No problem. Let's go. But there's no indication that's what's happening. Jesus isn't contrasting who meets the standards and who doesn't. Both the rich and the widow meet the standards that God set for them. Both meet the standard, but only one of them becomes the standard. Catch me? They're both meeting the standard. So what's happening is that when the church passed out the offering plates, the rich dropped their gifts in the offering plate, and so did the widow. But then the rich, they go back home from church and they swim in their pools like Scrooge McDuck, just full of like pools of like gold coins. But when the widow goes home, she rummages through her kitchen drawers for food stamps. And, but she's the standard, not the rich. The socially, relationally, financial lost one, the widow, becomes the standard. Because she sacrifices so much in her giving that she risks her survival to do it. Many of us aren't even meeting the standards. So I think it's oftentimes where we beat up on the rich here. Oh, the rich, look at them. We should all just be like the widow. For many of us, we're not even meeting the standard. We're not even giving. We're not giving close to what God is asking us to do. We're giving God leftovers The rich aren't giving God leftovers. They're giving him the 18, the 20, the 10%, whatever it is. At least they met the standards. But we, myself included, are oftentimes numbers of steps away from the widow in terms of sacrificial giving. And I think oftentimes, like, we say, well, all right, Evan, we get this, and, like, Liberty's done a decent job of reminding us, like, we don't live under the Old Testament law. We're now, like, we're New Testament people. But time and time again, what Jesus does, he doesn't lessen the standards of the Old Testament. He heightens them. So you think back to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, if you're angry at your brother, you should be punished for murder. Not if you actually murder someone. If you're angry at them, you're liable for judgment. You should be punished by God for that. He says, if you lust after a woman, that's adultery. Not if you actually sleep with someone who's not your spouse. If you lust after someone who's not your spouse, that's adultery. He says, you've heard it said, love your friends, but hate your enemies. But I say what? Love your enemies. Jesus doesn't take, he takes the Old Testament law and he doesn't say, hey, I'm here to make it easier on you. He says, no, I'm here and I'm heightening the law so you understand how you don't meet these standards and how much you need me. So in the Old Testament, 10 to 20% is the ceiling. In the New Testament, 10 to 20% becomes the floor. And so Jesus says, be so sacrificial in your giving that you risk your survival like this widow. So Jesus takes the commandments of the Old Testament, he heightens them, not just to cover our actions, but to cover our hearts. So the rich, like, their their actions are covered, right? They're meeting the standard, but Jesus says, hold a second, who's the standard? The widow. Why? Because in her heart, she risks everything. The rich, they they don't risk anything. And Jesus asks us, are you giving as much as the widow gives? And he says, this is what it looks like to follow me. Give like her. So giving has a cost. Right? You're probably like, hey, and and this is what I would normally say, and I like when you think what I'm thinking. I probably would say, hey, it sounds like a lot. Like, that's going to cost me a lot. Giving has a cost. Daryl Bach says, when God measures the life of service, he doesn't just count, he weighs. God doesn't just count, he weighs. God doesn't simply measure how much you give, he measures how much it costs you to give. He doesn't just measure how much money you're giving on Sundays or how much you're giving online. He weighs how much did it cost you to give that. 
Because only when it costs us something can we be free from the stranglehold that money can have on our lives and our souls and our hearts. Now, post-COVID, since the start of COVID, I'm not sure I'll ever return to a buffet ever again. Like, it's just like, not nah, my thing. I don't know who's touching what utensils. Like, I don't know who's, like, sneezing on stuff. So I'm like, I'm out on buffets. All right, but just imagine with me that you, like, you're going to a buffet. Like, you're going, like, Shady Maple near Lancaster, right? And, and there's, like, everything there, right? There's steak, there's chicken, there's french fries. There's a huge salad bar. I feel like I need to say that. There is one there. And it's like all the ice cream you can eat. And you're just like, I'm just going to go in right now, right? I paid like $25. I'm just going in as hard as I can. And I'm going to eat everything I want. But at some point, you have to say no, right? Otherwise, you're going to feel terrible. And they'll be rolling you out of the joint. See, life is often like a buffet. We have all these options. We have all these things that we want. And, and we... But if we really want to be happy, truly happy, we have to say no to some things. And that's self-denial. But the world often says, it's like, hey, if you're happy, like just, you know, just keep filling up with the happy. Keep filling in with all the options. And what happens is we get sick from that. We just need to keep, they keep saying, you just need to stuff your faces with all the options you have, all the things of this world that you can get, and jam, keep, just keep jamming food down your gullet, and you'll be all right. And that's self-gratification. That's what self-gratification looks like. See, self-denial, the greater principle that we want to see here is that self-denial is the way to true happiness. Jesus says in Luke 14, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. See, when we deny ourselves, we depend on God rather than things. Until you and I deny ourselves, until you give up your hopes and dreams, until you give up the house you want rather than the house you have, until you give up your life, the life you want, or the life you think your kids must have for some reason, which I never understand, like we believe we, our kids have to have these lives, these certain lives. Unless we take all those things and deny ourselves from them and place them at the foot of Jesus, you'll never be able to live in the freedom and happiness that Jesus offers. See, following Jesus requires a risk. Jesus looked up and he saw two kinds of people. He saw one kind of person who took no or little to no risk at all. And he saw one who risked it all. And you're probably asking yourself now, like, hold on a second. And again, I'm happy you're thinking what I'm thinking because I wrote it in my notes. Like, doesn't God want me to enjoy my life? Like, what's wrong with enjoying my life? I would say, like, absolutely God wants you to enjoy your life. But God says the road to true joy, the true happiness, is through self-denial, not self-gratification. Jesus says, or Paul quotes Jesus in Acts 20, verse 35. He says, remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said it's more blessed to give than to receive. See, if Jesus is right, and I hope you think he's right, the widow who risked it all is happier, that's what blessed means, than the rich. Jesus wants you to give for your happiness sake. And it's not weak, surfacey, no struggle, smile and act like everything's okay, happiness. It's deep, powerful, satisfying, sometimes holding on to dear life, but rooted in him, happiness. And he knows, Jesus knows you'll be happier if your life's posture is more give than it is get. You'll get a chance to see God work in your life. You'll get a front seat to God's work in your life by giving more than getting. You'll get a chance to step out in faith and trust God and get to see him come through. And sometimes that means bills are miraculously paid. Some of that's your story. Bills have been miraculously paid. You don't know how. Somebody paid it. Or the bank made an error. Or an envelope in cash with an anonymous note just saying, I love you. Just want you to have this. Well, it just lands in your mailbox. 
But most times it's things like standing in the midst of storms and trials and not being pulled and pushed to and fro in them. Sometimes it looks like hope in the fear of death. Sometimes it looks like contentment no matter how much we have or how little we have. See, in those times, your happiness will only be as strong as the thing you find your happiness in. Jesus is saying, I want you to be happy, but not this surfacey happiness. I want you to be happy and that you're rooted in me and you can trust me and you can depend on me. And you get to see me work through and in you. But most of us, if we're honest, we would like to take Jesus' statement and because we believe it's more blessed to receive than to give. In 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10, Paul says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires. All right, chill out, Paul. Right? That plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Paul's saying, listen, if you do self-gratification, if you run after money, if you run after the things of this world, that will only lead to destruction. He says, some people have even walked away from the faith because they ran after these things. Do you see Jesus fighting for your heart? He's saying, if you run after these things, if you're not going to depend on me, you're going to start depending on something else, and that's going to pull you away from me. And he says, I don't want that for you because I want you to be happy because self-gratification only leads to destruction. Teenagers, kids, I don't know if you realize this, but did you know that we as 21st century Americans are the richest people that have ever walked the face of the planet? Yet American Christians on average give less percentage of their income now than they did during the Great Depression. Shame on us. Myself included. Because statistically, the more money you make, the less percentage you're likely to give. The more money we make, the more likely we're to fall in love with our money. And we seek self-gratification over self-denial. And thus, we never take the risk required to be truly happy the way Jesus offers it. See, for most Americans, when it comes to giving, our survival is not at risk. Our vacations are. Our second homes are. Our kids' private education is. Our eating out is. Our trips to Starbucks are. Our new kitchen is. Our ability to gratify our desires, that's what's at risk, not our survival. It costs something to get deep, powerful, satisfying, sometimes holding onto dear life, but rooted in Jesus' happiness. But what do we do? We sell out our souls for what? More, one more vacation? Kids, teenagers, so let's, will you sell your soul out for the new, newest phone or video game or more clothes? Or we sell our souls out for what? Our new kitchen? Like that's what we're selling out, the happiness Jesus pro- promises us for these things? Self-gratification always leads to empty satisfaction. So kids, when mom tells you to not eat cookies before dinner, why? Why should she tell you that? Because it will ruin what? Your appetite. It will ruin dinner. Why does mom tell you that? Because cookies taste good, but they actually have little to no nutritional value. So what's going to happen is you're going to fill yourself with carbs and sugar, and then 10 minutes later, you're going to be hungry again. But if you eat it right before dinner, you're not going to eat at dinner, and then dinner is going to be past you, and you're going to be hungry the rest of the night. And, but a psychology also tells us maturity is the delaying of self-gratification. So you'll also never grow up if you're always reaching for cookies rather than waiting for dinner. And Jesus is saying, using your money, when I'm using my money for what I want rather than what God wants, it tastes so good, but it has no spiritual value to us. We end up running around with our wallets in the air, chasing after our dreams, our goals, and material things, many of which, many of which you'll never reach. 
And even if you do, your happiness burns out quickly. And then we're hungry again. And so what do we do? We double down on throwing our money at something else. Something else that won't satisfy us. But if we want to grow up, if we want to grow up in Christ, we can't keep saying yes to cookies and no to dinner. We can't keep saying yes to the things of this world and no to the freedom that comes in Jesus with self-denial. And oftentimes, we, you might object, but isn't generosity more than money? Like, I'm generous in other ways. And I have to be honest, about seven years ago, I was saying the same thing until a brother in Christ called me out on it. I remember like it was yesterday, we're driving back from a men's retreat, and he lovingly called me on the carpet about my giving. And he told me what he knew, what I, he knew what I was doing. I was manipulating God's commands so I don't have to change anything about myself. Sure, the Bible does tell us to be generous with our time and talents, but just as we had Mackenzie and Delaney say, it's not a world of or, it's a world of and. It's time, talent, and treasure. It's not time or talent or treasure. It's time, talents, and treasure. God wants all of that. So yes, continue to be generous in all these other ways, but God says there's one thing you lack. Like the rich young ruler, there's one thing you lack. And for many of us, I understand we feel like we can't give. Because we're, but for many of us, we say we can't give because we're making decisions with our money that make it that we can't. There are unnecessary things in my budget that I'm just not willing to give up, honestly. Listen to me, like, your family's going to be okay without vacations beyond your means. It'll be okay. Your kids will still love you if they go to public school. They will. They'll be fine. Why? Because you're their parents and you're seeking after the Lord. That's why they'll be fine. You'll be okay if you don't keep up with the Joneses. You will be okay. You honestly will be okay. I will be okay if I don't fix that thing or redo that bathroom or redo that kitchen or redo my patio. I'll be okay. The problem is we're often run after things that are ultimately empty to make ourselves okay. And I will tell you, I know men and women who make so much less than me that are just crushing it when it comes to giving. Because they give by the standard of the widow. It might not be much on paper, but it costs them so much more than it costs me. So each one of us, Paul says, must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. See, God wants you to deny yourself by giving sacrificially to him in his kingdom, not because I said so or even because he said so. He doesn't want you to grin and bear it. He doesn't want you to white-knuckle giving. He wants you to willingly and cheerfully give to him. Why? Because you're grateful for what he's done for you. He wants you to be cheerful in self-denial. We need to stop defending and start obeying God's commands. We need to start defending against God's commands, and we need to start depending on God to meet our needs, as Jesus says, to give us our daily bread. And we give to him as an act of worship. We take risks despite what it costs. Why? So we can have the freedom that Jesus promises us, to have happiness that Jesus promises us. And I know this is hard hitting. I know it's a tough topic. But Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so you by his poverty might become rich. See, what Paul's doing, he's trying to get the Corinthians to give, like the Macedonians. The Macedonians are poor, and Paul wants the rich Corinthians to start giving. And he doesn't appeal to them with a command. He appeals to them in love. He says, we give because Jesus has given. See, Jesus voluntarily became financially poor. He left heaven. This is the language that's actually being used. Jesus fi became financially poor so that you could become spiritually rich. It cost Jesus more than it cost the widow. Why? Because he gave up everything. Jesus didn't just risk his survival. He gives up his survival for you, for me. Jesus not only said it's better to give than receive, he actually lived it by giving his life up for you. God wants 
Jesus' self-denial to be the self-denial he's, he did to be your motivation for your self-denial through showing him he's worthy of your worship and by gratefully giving your money back to him. See, giving may cost us some, but we do it because it costs Jesus all. And if we come to grasp about how much Jesus gave up for us, C.S. Lewis says, Jesus giving up heaven for us is like you and I becoming a slug. Like you're like brown, you got all those spots all over you, you got that weird like saliva thing that goes on the sidewalk, whatever that is. Like that's like you becoming that. He says, if, you, if we understood how much Jesus did for us, we take risks in giving because if you depend on Jesus for your spiritual survival, you can depend on him to take care of your earthly survival. And you give at a cost to yourself, not bec- just because you want to meet a standard, but because you're grateful. Look, I know you may have, have a church background where you give because the church says so. Listen to me. I don't want you to give your money to liberty if it's not out of gratitude. I really don't want it. Because it's not me that I want to be happy. And it's not liberty that I want to be happy. It's I want you to be happy and cheerfully giving and being sacrificial in your giving. And I want the same for myself. So to do that, we have to leave behind self-gratification. We have to leave behind the stranglehold that money has on our lives and our souls. And we have to embrace self-denial as our road to freedom. We have to risk much in our giving. We have to give until it pinches So for some of us, we need to start just giving today. We need to give online. We need to give in the offering basket, in the offering box. But other of us, we just need to add to what we're giving. Just add a little bit. Take a step. Say, all right, this month, I'm going to add five bucks. Next month, if I can live off that, I'm going to give 10 more dollars. Next month, I'm going to give 20 more dollars. Next month, whatever it may be, keep increasing until you get to a point where it just hurts a little bit. But for some who have as much as the widows have, It just means giving pennies. And God is honored by that. Because you're giving cheerfully and sacrificially. It's just giving those few bucks that are in your wallet and tossing the offering plate. As I close, just, just a thought. Sometimes I like to think about what if Jesus had objections about saving us and acted on them? Like all the same objections we have, what if he had them? Like, what if Jesus decided not to meet God's standards like we often do? And what if he tried to hold back his life rather than giving up his life for us? Like, what if Jesus manipulated God's commands like I often do? Like I did before my friend called me out, and Jesus tried to get out of going to the cross. What if he lived in the world of or rather than and like we often do? So he generously lived a life that I should have lived, but he refused to die the death I deserved to die. Where would have that left me? Where would have that left you? This is what the Bible is getting at. Jesus had every objection imaginable, but that didn't stop him from doing what he did. He denied himself and took up the cross, and he invites you and I to do the same. For the sake of our happiness, despite what it costs us, because the giving God calls us to is measured not by what it costs, excuse me, is measured by what it costs. And we give out a gratitude for how much it costs Jesus.